All right. Hello, everybody out there in heavy metal land. My name is Alan, and it's that time again. Let's talk metal. Tonight, I'm going to make a video that I've been meaning to make for a while, and just for one reason or another, haven't gotten around to, but it is time. Tonight, I want to talk about my favorite heavy metal band that's new in the 21st century. You know, sometimes us older headbangers spend a lot of time listening to music from the past, and hey, that's what we like, we love it. There's a lot of great music from heavy metal in the 1980s and 1990s, and of course, even the 1970s. And sometimes we're too quick to dismiss or overlook you know, newer acts, and we think that uh, the newer bands just aren't quite as good, that you know we've heard it all before. But every now and then a band comes along that really gets your attention. And for me, that band in the 21st century is this one, Atlantean Codex from Germany. I want to do just kind of a quick overview of their releases. I'm not going to go through all the different variations and stuff. Um, those of you that watched some of my other videos know I tend to have multiple pressings of different things. And yes, I have more than one copy of pretty much all of these, but I'm not going to turn this into Atlantean Codex collection night. Just want to talk about the band for a while. They are far and away my favorite new heavy metal band of the 21st century. As corny as it might sound, this is one of those bands that I feel like it's my band. This is it. This is everything I want in heavy metal. I got on to Atlantean Codex about the time they were releasing some of their first stuff around 2007. Uh, one of the first releases I heard was this one held up a second ago. It's the Narcotic Finals, also known as the Narcotic Demos. Um, got this from Sentinel Steel Records about the time it came out. It was released in 2007, and I'm thinking I got it maybe about six months later. It might have been you know, early, mid-2008 at latest. And hadn't heard anything by the band at that point, but the name was interesting, you know, little kind of, you know, Lovecraft reference thing there, can dig it. Uh, it wasn't very expensive. Dennis had it on Sentinel Steel mail order with a pretty high recommendation. He's like, eh, it's not too expensive. It's an EP. I'll take a chance on that. And I remember very distinctly when I got it, I was sitting in my apartment <clears throat> was working on stuff for my dissertation, I think, just finished uh, work that day, and put it in the CD player for you to listen to this while I work. And something unusual happened. After, you know, the first 30, 60 seconds or so, I stopped everything I was doing and just sat and listened. Normally, I've just work along with music in the background. I keep pretty busy, got a lot of work to do. I'm just listening to stuff in the background. This made me stop. And before the first song was over, I remember very distinctly thinking in my mind, this is something I have been waiting to hear my entire time as a heavy metal fan and heavy metal collector. And I know that sounds very, very cheesy but I really do feel like this was a band I was waiting to hear. They do everything that I like in heavy metal. If you're not familiar with Atlantean Codex's sound, um, best way I could describe it would be take Man of Wars, Hail to England, sort of the pinnacle of Man of Wars, epic, uh, doomy tinged heavy metal, Mix in a lot of the grandiose aura and you know almost your know, mythical appeal of Bathory's Hammerheart album, and then mix in also the sort of clean vocal stylings of say early Solitude Eternus with that ethereal layers of doom but power underneath it. Mix all that together, and you're getting in the ballpark of what Atlantean Codex are doing. You can call it epic metal, I guess. You can call it doom-tinged power metal. I don't care. Whatever it is, it is a formula that they perfected right from the get-go and have done an amazing job with ever since. 
So yeah, this got my attention fast, and I immediately started digging to see what else the band had done. And they were doing a couple of releases right around that 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 range. Uh, their first release was a split with Vestal Clare. Uh, quick side note, Phil Swanson, best known as the vocalist from Hour of 13, but also worked with you know, a lot of other Doom bands there in the early 2000s, like Upwards of End Time, and Vestal Clare, and Atlantean Codex. He did sing with them for a brief period. Um, I don't have the Vestal Clare split. Atlantean Codex is one of those bands, unfortunately, who a lot of their random releases were done on pretty small pressings, and thus they're very difficult to obtain. You know, it's, you know, the first 89 people who click on the button or send the email fast enough got it. And I just, I'm, I'm not that cool. I don't get those things. But uh, regardless, did get one of the uh, compilations they appeared on early. This is a very cool one that features several bands that have gone on to do pretty well for themselves. Uh, I got it primarily for the Atlantean Codex track, but this one also features... I believe it's Enforcer and Portrait are on here. Ram is on here. Uh, so yeah, pretty good lineup. It's uh, New Age of Iron, Volume 1. Uh, there's a couple of different versions of it in terms of colors of vinyl and stuff like that. But it includes a great uh, self-titled track from Atlantean Codex that I absolutely loved. Um, another thing they released early on was a live album. And this was one of those, there were literally like 89 numbered copies and maybe a handful of unnumbered ones that got into circulation. I was literally, I think, number 93 on the email button. Yeah, that's why I don't do those things anymore. So by the grace of Lemmy and, and eBay and too much money, I did later get a copy of this live album that they kind of self-released early on. Now, they've done several live recordings over time, and they always called them the Annihilation of wherever they were playing, different places in Europe mainly. So this one is the Annihilation of Koringshofen. German is not my strong suit. Um, but yeah, so the band was you know putting out product there in the 2007 to 2009 range. Lots of good material, and it was only a matter of time until they got an album out. And get an album out they did. Uh, again, lots of different pressings and things. These are all really nicely packaged in gatefolds and uh, with booklets and inserts and such. But their first album from 2010, The Golden Bow, uh, is a magnificent sort of epic doom power hybrid mix opus. Um, let's just go ahead and play a little clip from one of the tracks so that you get a better idea of what they sound like. This is a little bit from one of my favorite tracks off of it called Temple of Catholic Magic. we 
okay, I'm just going to have to stop it there. I'll play the whole bloody song. Uh, amazing, crushingly heavily stuff. Uh, the vocals of Marcus Becker are just sublime on their material. The guy is the true prophet in the forest. Uh, he is the oracle at Delphi delivering prophecy that nobody believes but always comes true yes i am excited it sounds cheesy i don't care this is my band i love these guys amazing debut album and they would only go from strength to strength on their sophomore effort which came out in 2013 and is called the white goddess um if i had one minor complaint about this album is that the cover paintings a little a uh, little generic there um i'm sure it's from some older classical painting but uh a little plain maybe just a bit um the question of course lingered could they keep up the momentum could they build on such an incredible debut oh yeah yeah they could do that uh most folks consider this album a head and shoulders above their previous outing, which is amazing, hard to believe, but they wasted no time uh, getting down to work with the opening track, which I'll play just a little bit of. And this one kicks off with a track called Soul Invictus. Soul, soul. Okay, once again, if I don't stop now, I'll just let the whole album play. Um, Soul Invictus might be my favorite heavy metal song of the past decade. That thing is incredible. Runs for about 10 minutes. Never get tired of it. Um, it is amazing power, amazing heaviness. Lyrically, it is truly amazing. If you want to go down a long, long Wikipedia rabbit hole sometime, Try looking up Soul Invictus and delving into the history behind that phrase. And that is one of the things I really appreciate about Atlantean Codex. And they've done this throughout their career, but um, tracks like Soul Invictus, it really stands out. This band finds the perfect way to blend the historical, the mythical, and the magical into a coherent whole on each and every one of their songs. There are, yes, you know, elements of the typical epic fantasy, you know, metal there, but it's not the, you know, yay, barbarians, raise your sword, metal rules, but it is, but it's wrapped in these layers of historical context and obscure sort of theological contexts. 
and mythological contexts. One of the band members you know, is a professor of, I believe it's German or European mythology. They know their shit. It's well written, it's well researched, and it's very deep. It works on multiple levels. And that really appeals to me much more than having some two dimensional and throw away fantasy lyrics. There are too many bands you know, that take that easy route of just taking a few, you know, you know, Robert Howard ideas or Lovecraft ideas and just, you know, kind of copy and paste the words into it. And Atlantean Codex really craft their lyrics. They are put together extremely well, um, as well as the packaging. You saw some of the booklet there and stuff I was looking through. All their albums come with that kind of detail in the booklets and inserts and gatefold, and it, they're incredibly nice packages, even by the standards of modern vinyl. So yeah, White Goddess, incredible stuff. I want to play one more clip from this one just to show that the band also um, can do sort of slower, quieter uh, songs as well that come across as very beautiful, but still very heavy. This will be a clip from a song called 12 Stars in an Azure Gown. I've got to skip ahead a little bit. I wish I could speak to you today. There's a clip from 12 stars in an azure gown, just showing the real range and versatility of the band. Their songs are not samey. Every one has a very distinct feel to it. They're very distinct from one another. So where do you go from there? Well, the band has continued forth. In 2017, they did another live recording. This one I only got on CD. This is the Annihilation of Bavaria. It's a multi-disc set. Very good live recording, good song selections and all. Um, their stuff works well as live tracks, but the a little you do lose a little bit of the magical aura when you go from you know, the studio to the live setting with this kind of stuff. So still a good live recording. The band released their third and most recent LP in 2019. And this one is called The Course of Empire. And... It is, once again, a fantastic outing. It's relatively similar in style to The White Goddess. There's less of a change or, you know, step up from a White Goddess to this than there were between the previous two albums. But uh, I think even this is uh, a step above The White Goddess in terms of overall quality. Um, once again, it's a phenomenal package from, you know, what they've got on the record labels to the oversized booklets with artwork that they print with them. Um, the band really, really does a fantastic job lyrically throughout the album. A lot of the songs, there's sort of a historical theme to the record about, you know, different kingdoms, different empires over time, you know, that have risen, had their heyday, but then also faded into the past. And the way the lyrics are crafted in a lot of the songs, they can very easily be interpreted as talking about modern events and what has happened to Western society in the past handful of years. And with a lot of people wondering if certain countries have sort of passed their prime and you know have things started to unravel, that it is the course of all empires to eventually fall. But it's still told through this historical lens of whether they're singing about Assyria or 
something from you know, Byzantium history. Um, it all weaves together so well. Again, I cannot stress how good they are at taking a subject and making it seem historical, mythical, and magical all at the same time. Uh, it's just interwoven so incredibly well. Okay, well, I've geeked out in fanboy mode for a solid 20 minutes here about Atlantean Codex. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the clips. If you haven't heard the band before, it gives you a chance to check them out. Highly recommend all of their stuff. You really can't go wrong with any of their releases. If you're looking for something to start with, I'd say White Goddess or Course of Empire. Uh, they've gotten universal acclaim. Um, work your way back to the other stuff if you really like the band. It's excellent quality as well. I don't think you'll be disappointed by a single thing that you hear. And so that's it. That is my favorite band to have emerged from heavy metal in the 21st century. This is my band, and I love everything they have done so far. This is one of the few bands that one day I might would consider traveling long distance to see play live just once in my lifetime. We'll see. Never know. All right. With that, let's talk metal in the comments down below. Is there any band from the 21st century that you really have this kind of almost personal connection with that you really feel like this is your pet band, that this is something you waited your whole life to hear and it came together and it's just exactly perfect for you? Uh, if so, let me know in the comments down below. And with that, I want to wrap this up. Everybody take care. And until next time, keep banging your head, preferably to Atlantean Codex.